without, with autism. So that's the understanding of the social part of autism. What about a theory that would help us to understand something about the rigid and repetitive behavior in autism? Well, an important part of the autism cognitive phenotype seems to be executive dysfunction. So executive function is the umbrella term given to all of those uh, higher order functions uh, typically subserved by the prefrontal cortex that allow us to cope with novelty and change. So they allow us to monitor our behavior, to be flexible and to suppress habitual behavior that's no longer relevant. Some very interesting research has suggested that in some case of frontotemporal dementia, there are released talents. So this is the case of Anne Adams as an example, who um, very nobly allowed herself to, to be studied and as she went into dementia and as her artistic talent and her artistic productions became really much more marked and uh, exaggerated and impressive, um, exactly as her uh, frontal cortex was deteriorating. And based in part on those findings, Alan Snyder has made the rather extraordinary suggestion that we might be able to turn off our frontal lobes to release savant-like skills. Now, I'm not entirely convinced, I have to say, by this. And uh, if you look at the pictures of the dog drawn um, uh, before, during, and after TMS, trans magnetic stimulation, to shut off temporarily part of the uh, cortex, I'm not sure it's quite savant stuff, but it's an interesting, interesting theory. It also, of course, uh, completely ignores development to think that we can simply uh, make a, a momentary lesion that's going to create a savant. But it is very important to remember that although autism is marked by rigidity and uh, repetitive preferences in behavior and in thought, actually repetition is not the enemy of creativity. So the third and last aspect of autistic cognition I want to mention in relation to talent is um, uh, an extraordinary eye for detail, which has been sometimes referred to as weak central coherence. And Kanna, indeed, who was one of the first people to describe autism, talked about autism as being marked by an inability to experience wholes without full attention to the constituent parts. And he goes on to explain how, for a child with autism, if you change any tiny detail of a situation, it's no longer recognized as being the same thing. And indeed, there are uh, children with autism, I know, for example, who, when their teacher gets a different set of glasses, no longer seems to recognize the teacher or calls her by the name of somebody else who happens to have the same type of glasses frames. And this idea of eye for detail is uh, well captured in a National Autistic Society poster, which um, says, when a person with autism walks into a room, the first thing they see is a pillow with a coffee stain shaped like Africa, a train ticket sticking out of a magazine, um, 35 floorboards, a remote control, a paper clip on the mantelpiece, a marble under the chair, and et cetera, et cetera. And at the bottom it says, so it's hardly surprising they ignore you completely. <laughs> and perhaps the most important aspect of this theory of autism is that it highlighted for the first time that we can learn as much about autism by looking at what people with autism are better at compared to neurotypicals versus what they find difficult. So um, people with autism, for example, with the eye for detail that they show, are often very good at this kind of task, spotting the difference. And unless you happen to have autism or be sitting next to somebody with autism, you may not have spotted all the difference. And when I gave this talk um, uh, to an audience, but I'd had people with autism, they also pointed out some other ones that I was missing. Um, I think this one here. So. And we've also used various um, tests that can demonstrate this eye for detail through superior performance. So here in the embedded figures task, you have to find the simple shape hidden in, camouflaged in the compound shape, which we see, of course, as a gestalt. But people with autism may see as a, a, a set of parts put together. And this goes some way towards explaining why, for example, in the artistic savant domain, most artists show an extraordinary attention to detail and often produce their drawings by drawing detail to detail rather than sketching the whole. This is a, a beautiful cityscape drawn by uh, Gilles Train, who is a multi-talented savant. Among other things, we've published a case study of his ability to identify the pitch of any environmental sound and of voices and so on. And indeed, he was late to speak, but when he did speak, he asked his parents, uh, why does mummy say hi in C and daddy says hi in G? <laughs> so you can see his eye for detail. You can also see the creativity in this imagined city that he created. 
It also seems to go some way towards explaining uh, musical savants and uh, skills in other areas. So uh, musical savants uh, almost universally show absolute pitch. And whereas ordinary children uh, transition from uh, remembering songs by precise pitches to remembering the melody of a song, individuals with autism seem to maintain the ability to remember the exact exemplars. Um, and indeed, many children with autism who don't have any musical training show that they actually have absolute pitch if, if tested. So we've uh, gone on to try and, and find out why it might be and which aspects of autism go with talent. And very briefly, we've used the Twins Early Development Study, um, which is a study of all the twins born in England and Wales in 94 to 96, to try and look at the relationship between talent and autism. And this is a population-wise study, so we used trait-wise measures of autistic traits, so how good is your child at maintaining conversations, for example. We asked parents at eight um, these various trait-wise questions about autism. We also asked them, is your child unusually good at music, math, art, or memory? Much better than children even a lot older. And what we found was that the children for whom their parents said, uh, yes, he has a special talent, were also said to have more autistic traits, and specifically to have more autistic traits of the rigid and repetitive sort that we've linked to that eye for detail. And uh, when we did cross-twin, cross-trait correlations and twin modeling, we found that effectively uh, quite a large proportion of the genetic influence on those autistic traits is overlapping with the genetic influence on having talents, parent reported talents. So ingredients for talent in autism, an eye for detail, a mind insulated from other minds, fixed and persistent interests that all come together in people with autism. And each of these may be important in talent in the general population, but in autism we have this, this magical catalytic mix. Uh, why does it matter? Uh, because for people like Natty Jones, who has half, hardly any language, the joy of communicating through his art and the respect that he achieves through his art is really worthwhile. And music is a space that neurotypical and autistic people can absolutely speak the same language in. And low self-esteem and depression and anxiety uh, make life miserable for people with autism and can be significantly improved by the development of skills and skills that can go on to employment and many companies that now specifically seek to employ people with autism. So uh, thank you to the many people who've worked on this. Thank you to the Academy of Medical Sciences for asking me to speak. Thank you for your attention. Thank you.